My guest today is acclaimed Australian composer Nicole Murphy. Nicole is the recipient of numerous awards and has been commissioned by eminent arts organisations including the Australian Ballet, the Royal Academy of Dance, London, Experiments in Opera, Symphony Space, New York, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and Orchestra Victoria. She holds a PhD from the University of Queensland and on the 28th of May, QIS will perform the world premiere of a major new work by Nicole entitled Present, Past and Future. Nicole, welcome to Conversations at QIO. Thank you. At 30 minutes duration, present, past and future is, is, is a large composition. Is it the longest piece for orchestra you've ever written? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely the longest piece for orchestra. I've got longer pieces for chamber ensembles, but in terms of duration and instrumentation, it's definitely the largest. People who have not seen an orchestral score may not be aware of just the kind of volume of information that is contained in, in, a, in a score for a piece of music lasting 30 minutes. We first spoke in August last year about you writing a piece for QIS. How do you get started on such a big project? Taking a deep breath, I guess. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, it's a really exciting proposition to have this big landscape of time, um, you know, because that's kind of our big tool as a composer is how you play with space and time. And so that large landscape of time is really exciting. And so for me, the work always begins away from the piano or away from the desk, just thinking about what I want to communicate, what the instrumentation suggests, suggests to me, which for an orchestra is you know, these limitless possibilities. Um, and yeah, just thinking thematically what I want to respond to, what I want to be writing about, what I want to communicate in the piece. In this instance, can you remember what was the first idea that came to you? So this piece, I suppose, it could really be summed up by the idea of it's about time and in a few different ways it was very much of the time it was written this kind of summer of 2021 20, 22 um, sort of current events that were happening at the time each movement's based on a different piece of um, poetry from literature that I was reading in that time period and it's also really reflective of the time um, of lives of the musicians so I was thinking very closely about like where they're at in their musical journey and their life journey of what it was like to be that age in that time period of your life. So the fact that it was for a youth orchestra and for younger musicians definitely played a, a part in your, your creative process? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, as a composer, you always want to have a connection to the ensemble you're writing for, or the musicians you're writing for. And so that was really the forefront of what I was thinking about. Yeah, well, we must have had oh, four or five weeks of rehearsal on the piece so far, and um, we're loving it. I've had heaps of feedback from the orchestra that they're really enjoying it. I remember asking you, um, just I didn't want to put too many constraints, but just I remember saying, you know, try and make sure everybody has something to play, you know, um, so that we don't have instrument groups um, sitting around without much to do. And I think it's extraordinary that you've written a piece that doesn't sound busy all the time at all, and yet everybody has rewarding things to play. Well, I'm really pleased because that is one of the things that I, you know, I've sat in ensembles before where you're counting rests for many, many bars, and, and then the bit that you play, it might just be that you're playing this one little bit that's really intricate or fascinating, or you can hear how it contributes to the piece as a whole, and then it becomes instantly satisfying and rewarding. And so I just, it's really important to me that every musician has that bit that is, you know, might be a slight challenge for their instrument, but the reward is worth that little, you know, extra work or, you know, that they can really hear how they hold that whole movement together or they've got that little moment of a solo where we hear the timbre of their instrument kind of shine through. So that's something I try and do when I write. Um, and it's always that kind of balance of the logistics of writing the music you're wanting to write and communicating what you're trying to communicate balanced alongside the, the practicalities of what instruments can do what um, you know what feels good on their instrument what sort of idiomatic how do you make that instrument sound the best it can sound and make it rewarding as well I think one thing that I've enjoyed about this as a conductor is that um, and you sense the players do as well of working out how their part fits into the whole and you can kind of sense those cogs those little cogs in rehearsing the score and yet um, the, the impression of the whole is um, seamless and I think that's something that that is not so easy to do. So thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. And I mean, that is the essence of an orchestra, right? It is this, all these little cogs within this large machine. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, that's the kind of the compositional challenge and like the fun of it is working out all those those inner parts and then stepping back and looking at the whole. Yeah, in the preface to your score, you talk about two writers, two poets who I didn't know, um, Antigone Kafala and Richard James Allen, and they provided you with um, inspiration for the piece. Who are these writers and what do they mean to you? So Antigone Kafal is a tremendously beautiful writer that I've only recently discovered, sadly, um, but also happily because now I've got a whole lifetime of work to, to wade through. Um, and I just picked up a, a, comp a collection of her poetry um, just before you know, our conversation. I'd sort of started to, to look through it. And there were just, just, I mean, the writing is absolutely stunning. There's this beautiful brevity to her work. It's very simple language in some ways, but says everything it needs to say. Um, yeah, it's just very transparent and beautiful. And whenever I read writing that really speaks to me or see a piece of art that really speaks to me or hear something that speaks to me, I want to respond to it in some way or you know, shine some, a little tiny light on it. And so I knew that at some stage that, that her work would kind of, I'd, I'd want to respond to it. And so the outer two movements respond to two different poems of hers. And then the inner movement, the second movement, is based on a poem found in the middle of a novel by Richard James Allen, who's a writer that I've um, admired for many, many years and have worked with uh, his text previously in a few pieces that respond to his work uh, and also in a chamber opera that uses um, his um, piece, The Kamikaze Mind, as a, his novella as um, the libretto for that chamber opera. And so he's a writer that I keep coming back to. He's got this amazing imagery and it's at one minute it's heartbreaking and the next minute it's hilarious. It's, you know, it's active and vivid and vibrant and it's this, yeah, something that really resonates with me about his work. So it's just lovely to have that long-term relationship with someone's work. If, if I can just reflect on the second movement for a second, um, the second movement has a lot of prominent percussion parts and it has this incredibly gritty driving rhythm that starts low in the orchestra, eventually overwhelms the whole orchestra. We have a metric modulation where suddenly the tempo becomes uh, considerably faster and the whole thing starts again. And then we have this middle section, which I really love, but it's incredibly murky is the word that you actually use in the score. Uh -huh. um, and it really sounds like you're lost in these dense clouds or, or, or mist, but it's kind of a, a, a dark mist somehow, for me anyway, before the, the driving rhythms return and, and then the movement ends. I find it such an interesting sound world um, to have as a middle movement to the piece. Um, what were some of your thoughts, you know, in, 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 in the emotions that you wanted to communicate? So this piece, um, I mean, the poem is a real sense of undoing, of unwinding, of turning back time. Because this is the movement which is past, right? It is, yeah. it is. Um, and the poem, you know, has these wonderful images of, you know, taking the words out of Finnegan's Wake and returning them to the dictionary or unnailing the wood and, you know, returning the trees to the forest. And, so undoing. Yeah, this sense of undoing and this kind of, I mean, the, the text is like, it's very turbulent and active and... Um, and vibrant and I really wanted that sense of kind of this undoing of things of bending time which you know is reflected in that metric modulation and again in kind of finding yourself in this deconstructed state of that murky fog in the middle um, and just kind of that general sense of yeah energy and chaos that kind of comes like in my mind that was always kind of the chaos groove was that little bass part that was sort of its its yeah. name on my, my sketches was, you know, Chaos Groove's going to start again here. Chaos and... Groove. I'm going to tell the orchestra that. <laughs> That's really cool. So it's um, almost like an unwinding or rewinding of time to get to the past. Absolutely. And an undoing of structures and systems that kind of have led us to where we are now. Yep. And then the last movement then, future. Whose future? Is that the, the young players in the orchestra? All of our futures? Well, I mean, I guess it is all of our futures, but largely coming from that sense of the, the future of the players in the orchestra. Um, the poem that that's based on, Metro Cellist, is, you know, talks about this, the sound of a, you know, hearing the sound of a cellist, a busker in the underground where, you know, there's all of this noise and chaos and activity going on, but there's this persistence um, or insistence, I suppose, of that sound that travels through the halls and bounces off the tiles and reflective surfaces. Um, and, you know, that, that is there, this insistent sound that perseveres despite all of this noise and chaos around them. 
and the you know there's a line in the poem about the exuberance of youth and to me that that movement is the celebration of the optimism and energy and exuberance of youth in the first movement there's a section for um i believe it's glockenspiel vibraphone and harp that i remember in a rehearsal you said oh it's like a music box um does the idea of a music box have particular associations for you yeah i mean it's it's a fascinating question because at first I think, oh, I don't really think so. But when I, when I sort of gave it some thought, the idea of uh, the music box, you know, there is that sense of, of that childhood notion of a music box. And I was thinking back to, um, to, to what I had as a, a kid and I had this carousel that you could wind up and it played, you know, music as it went around and I was fascinated by it. And every Christmas or birthday, I'd get like another horse to put on or another carriage. Um, and I spent hours playing with that thing. And then I also had, which I'm sure many people my age had, the little pink and white box that you opened up, a jewellery box that had the spinning ballerina with the music in it. So I suppose there have been these kind of music boxes um, in my past that maybe those sounds are kind of, not intentionally, but they must just be embedded in there somewhere. I mean, I remember looking up um, Antigone Kefala's um, poetry and reading some of her poems and fragments is such a good title for the collection of poems um, that these two poems come from um, because so as you so beautifully said before it's so simple and elegant but sometimes the juxtaposition of images is quite jarring almost um, and sometimes I think in your music in this piece we hear familiar sounds but they're given a different context and I have a similar sense like oh it sounds like a music box, but then what follows it is, is by association, makes you respond to it very differently. Um, so was that something you were consciously trying to do? or I think it's probably a stylistic fascination of mine, this idea of things that sound familiar but also strange. Mm. You know, in that sense of it feels like, you know, it might be gestures that we're familiar with, particularly as classical musicians, you know, and an instrument like the orchestra has these sort of gestures that are inbuilt to the language of, of what we know as that, as the orchestra as an instrument. Um, so I suppose it's a way of writing those things that do feel familiar, but then also have a sense of surprise or kind of a looking from a different angle, because that's what interests me in music. You know, I want to go to a concert and hear things I didn't know I wanted to hear. And so that idea of surprise is, yeah. is always fun in you know to me and so that's sort of I guess why it's in my music yeah I mean how much pressure do you feel as a composer to say something new say something different say something original you know there is this long history of, of orchestral music that all of us who are trained musicians are aware of yeah I mean a lot I suppose is the easy answer to that question it and I think you I guess oh, I would like to say as you get older you feel it less but I think you just feel it in different ways um, you know, when you're a young composer, you've all you're doing is looking up to the this select canon of works that are the the best of the best. Or, you know, so society has decided, um, you know, this carefully curated list that has been taught for generations, um, and so you're always comparing these works as a you know as a beginner composer with these highly refined works of professionals, um, and then I suppose as you gain more confidence in your craft and more experience you in some ways start to become haunted by your own music of trying to not repeat, you know, you have your sense of style, but you don't want to repeat similar gestures and sort of be stuck in the same process as you want to always be innovative and, you know, within your language. Mm. So you start to be haunted by different... You don't want to repeat yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I found it fascinating and a bit funny, um, the anecdote about Schoenberg telling his composition students right at the end of his life when he was living in, in California that there are still lots of good melodies in C major, um, having you know, spent his whole career reinventing the tonal, well, inventing a, an atonal system of composition. Um, so maybe, maybe as, as you get older, you're, you're less concerned with style. I think you also realise it's something you can't really escape. Um, yeah, I, I think as much as, as you can try and you're using different processes, I think, I mean, we look at the work of any composers who's had a stylistic evolution and it still sounds like that composer, no matter what kind of musical devices they're using, there yeah. is something of you infused in the music. I don't think that can really be escaped. Can't escape yourself. <laughs> yeah, Stravinsky yeah. still sounds like Stravinsky, regardless of whether it's neoclassical Stravinsky, 
Rite of Spring, Stravinsky, or later when he's even writing 12-tone music, he still sounds the same. Well, not the same, he still sounds like... Like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's interesting because in the second half of this concert, we're performing two works by Richard Strauss, uh, an earlier work, um, Also Sprach Zarathustra, from the very beginning of his career when he was only 34 years old, and then one of the last pieces he wrote. And they're both very different, but also still share a language. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to your youth and your childhood. Do you have some early musical memories? You know, when did you first connect to music? Um, I think, I mean, I have a mother who played the piano and just loves music. Um, didn't play, you know, as a, played as a hobby, not as a career. Um, so I suppose I came from a family of music lovers, but not musicians. Um, and I learnt piano, you know, sort of typical, uh, maybe six or seven years old, you know, that sort of typical Amy B system kind of upbringing with piano. And then later on, as I became interested in sound and trying to work out how other instruments worked, picked up a few other instruments as well. Um, but I guess my, my early days as a musician were fairly fairly ordinary, like I loved music, I loved playing, I don't know if I practiced as much, although I mean I was probably practicing enough, but I was always at the piano doing something, um, whether it was effective practice or not. <laughs> so you didn't have to be encouraged to go to the piano, you, would, you were at the piano every day, but you might have been composing, do you think you were kind of experimenting yourself from yeah, an early absolutely. age? Yeah, absolutely, I mean I didn't know that there was a difference between composing and performing, I just never kind of heard those words when I was younger, I suppose, or not consciously. Um, and I used to write a lot and I would write in, in manuscript, you know, write all my ideas down, beautifully neat handwriting, far nicer than my sketches these days, which are just a mess. Um, but, you know, ruled lines and lovely. Anyway, I've still got these volumes of these awful pieces uh, by, you know, eight-year-old me. Um, and I remember one day my mum took them to my piano teacher and um, she photocopied them and gave them to other students, which was like this terrible breach of what was like a very private pastime for me um, when I think about it now. But that was the first time that I realised that composing wasn't just an activity that you did when you made music, that it was this kind of distinct, separate activity that not everyone who played the piano was doing. Not every musician is a yeah, composer. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I suppose we all are in some ways, but that, it, you know, I'd never, I just assumed that was this creative practice. You played music, you wrote music, you improvised, you, that was just kind of what I did. So I guess it was just this innate fascination with it. Um, and I, when I was playing as well, there was a lot of improvisation of, um, you know, changing endings and restructuring cadences to suit my either laziness for not wanting to learn fingering or uh, because I precociously thought that I could write, you know, better voice leading, you know, that this line should descend rather than ascend or something. Uh, than the greats. So there was that part as well, which no doubt would have driven my piano teacher wild. But <laughs> Was there a moment when you realised that becoming a composer is actually an, op an option for as a, as a career choice, as a, as a life choice? Yeah, absolutely. When I was sort of in my young teens, um, we had the composer Sarah Hopkins come and workshop a piece of hers with my school choir. And I just remember distinctly this lady walking in and saying, oh, hi, I'm Sarah, I'm a composer. And I just, it was it absolutely floored me because I didn't realize that at that stage that composer, composing was a job, that there were living composers, um, you know, that they were female, that they were living in my local area. Um, and so that was a, a really distinctive moment for me going, ah, oh, this, you know, I didn't see this in the job guides. <laughs> yeah, right. And then when you told your parents that you wanted to be a composer, were they, were they supportive or nervous or? I mean, probably both, but mm. they outwardly appeared supportive yeah. um, and, you know, and always have been. And I think, I mean, my parents have had their own businesses, so they understand the idea of, of making your own way in the world, yeah. I suppose, mm. and have just always been supportive of wanting, you know, myself and my sister just wanting to do something that we enjoyed. Yeah. Um, and building something of your own in exactly, ways when yeah. you're composing. Thank you so much for writing such a fantastic piece for QIS. We're all really thrilled that you made that what I think is still a courageous choice to pursue a career as a composer. And um, we're delighted and I think we will perform it um, many times. I hope other orchestras do as well. And thank you for coming and talking to us today. My pleasure. Thank you.